Hello, everyone. Hi. Good to see you. Go ahead and uh, type your first name or your nickname into chat for me, if you would. So I can take attendance. Thank you. Appreciate that. We still got a minute or so to go before four o'clock. So we'll let a couple more people come in. Hopefully we won't have any more problems with Zoom. That's great, thank you. All right. So um, I can see that several of you have already finished your lecture exam, which is scheduled for today. Thank you very much for getting that done. If you haven't taken the exam yet today, remember you're gonna to wanna to get that submitted by eight o'clock tonight. Um, don't let that slip your mind. I had a question about that actually. Did that time change originally at the beginning of the semester? Was it midnight or am I just? Um, the, you may be thinking that the, um, oftentimes the exam is stays open until midnight, but it's due at eight. That may be what you're thinking of. So you may see that it's set so that uh, it'll stay open till 11.59 PM. Um, that's just in case anybody has any problems or um, contacts me and tells me that they can't get it in by eight o'clock. So that may be what you're thinking of. But it's usually 8 PM is the submission time for exams. So we have the exam today, and um, we also have a um, laboratory exercise that we'll be doing together today, which is about special media. And you have a, la a lecture topic this week, which is uh, biochemistry, I believe. Um, a difficult lecture topic for sure. So make sure you give yourself plenty of time to watch that lecture and take a nice set of notes for yourself. Um, looks like just about everybody's here now. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you so we can just take a look at our schedule, just as a reminder. Let me get rid of that. So hopefully what you're seeing on your screen is our homepage on Canvas. And I'm just gonna go over here um, in the left menu and I'm gonna click on modules and then scroll down to this week, which is the week of the 15th. Um, yes, yeah, so here's the uh, quiz for the biochemistry lecture topic this week. Um, again, for some students, this is really just a review lecture. Um, if you have a strong background in um, biochemistry related things or chemistry related things in general. But for some of us, it's, um, there's a lot of new materials. So just be sure you leave yourself plenty of time um, to go through that lecture on YouTube and then get your quiz done. And of course, here's the lab homework assignment for the week, which is about what we're doing today. And then just looking ahead to next week, um, next week we'll be moving forward into the topic of microbial growth and also the methods that we use to control microbial growth. And in lab next week, we'll be talking about um, oxygen, and oxygen requirements that microbes have and how we have to know those requirements so that we can match them in the lab so that our microbes can grow for us. And we'll also be talking about um, controlling microbes with chemical disinfectants. So that'll be coming up next week. 
All right. So does anybody have any questions about anything? Any material that you've been watching for lecture or any uh, questions about quizzes or lab homework or anything like that? I haven't yet graded this week's, uh, the, the lab homework you handed in for me on Sunday, but um, I'll be getting to that tomorrow. So look for your grade tomorrow on that. Good, all right, very good. So I'm gonna go ahead and move into our laboratory material for today, which is again about this topic that we call special media. Uh, we have lots and lots of options for culture media in the microbiology lab. And we've talked about a couple of them. We've talked about some of the very common types of media we use, things like nutrient agar and nutrient broth we certainly have media that we can use just to grow microbes. Um, we give them the nutrients that they need and pretty much any microbe can grow. And if we have trouble with a particular microbe, we can add in an, an ingredient like blood or serum or even things like egg or milk. You can add that into a medium, make it more complex. And sometimes you can get these fastidious or, or difficult to grow organisms to grow for you when you add those ingredients in. But what we're talking about today is something very different. Now we're gonna start talking about the kinds of culture media that we have available that actually help us identify microbes based on how they grow in these types of media. So we refer to this as special media, and it's a big class of media. So there's lots of different types of special media. But the idea is that it's a kind of media that we're gonna use to grow microbes um, very specifically. In other words, there are some microbes that will grow on a type of special media and some microbes that won't be able to. The, and then when certain microbes grow, we can look at how they're growing and learn a little bit about them. And it helps us build up some data so that we can identify whatever particular microbe we're interested in identifying. And of course, anytime we have a patient, someone who's in a hospital or in a doctor's office and the physician has gathered some sort of a sample, maybe body fluid sample, and sent it into the microbiology lab, our task is to figure out what that organism is. And we said, you know, you can do things like gram staining, certainly, and get some information about the gram status of the organism. That's very helpful. And we can certainly grow the organism using some of our more basic media. But then we can also turn to these special media to help us narrow down the possibilities for what that microbe is so that we can then report back to the physician exactly which microbe um, is causing disease in their patient. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our slides. And that's what you should be looking at now on your screen. You should see the title slide, Lab Special Media. So in terms of our objectives for this exercise, first thing we're gonna do is talk about all six basic types of culture media that we have available to us, including the ones we've talked about so far and today's type, which, is, which are these special media. Now within the special media category, we're gonna talk about two types. One is called selective media and one is called differential. We'll talk about what the differences are between those culture media. And then we're gonna do a little experiment together. So we'll, we will actually uh, generate some data and we can evaluate our results together as a group today using two of these special media. One of them is called mannitol salts auger 
and we uh, abbreviate that MSA. And the other one is called eosin methylene blue or EMB. So we're gonna try our hand at growing some microbes and we'll use how they grow on the plates to try to identify the microbes that we have. So remember when, we, when we're talking about culture media, we're talking about a huge group of different materials, different chemicals and different types of media. And we can formulate those media to be either solid or semi-solid or liquid, a, a broth. We can add our ingredients to media to make whatever particular media we're trying to achieve. So if we're making a broth, for example, a liquid broth, we're essentially just adding various nutrients and other chemicals to water. And if we're making a solid, an auger, we can add nutrients and other materials to an auger base. Remember when we use that word auger, we're just talking about that very special carbohydrate molecule that we use to create that gelatinous solid media that we put in the bottom of Petri dishes. The auger itself is just what allows that material to solidify. We have to add ingredients to the auger to give the microbes the nutrients they need to grow. In terms of semi-solid culture media, generally what we're talking about is a broth, a liquid culture media that we add just a little bit of auger to. And that's gonna turn that liquid into something that's a little bit between a liquid and a solid. So it's sort of a thick liquid. So we've been talking just very generally about the kinds of media that we use when we just wanna grow microbes. And if you remember, we have two particular categories of media that we use when we're growing microbes. We have what we call chemically defined media. That's the kind of culture media that just has a list of ingredients, known ingredients inside of it. And then we have what we call complex media, which is essentially a chemically defined media that we add one of these very complex ingredients to, something like blood or egg or meat. Um, we obviously don't know exactly what's in there. We know we put blood in it, but we don't know all of the individual molecules that are in blood. We don't know all of the individual molecules that are in meat or egg, for example. So we call those kinds of media complex because they have some unknown substances in them. Uh, an organism that is easy to grow, an organism that has very um, simple nutritional requir requirements that will grow on a chemically defined media for us usually without any trouble at all. But there are some bacteria that have very specific nutritional requirements and those we're gonna need a complex media in order to grow. So you'll hear this word fastidious. A fastidious organism is an organism that has some of these special requirements. It just has very particular nutritional needs and it's hard to grow. So we have to use a more complex culture media for those. If they're non-fastidious, that just means they're pretty easy to grow. They have very basic nutritional requirements and we can grow them on a more simple media. So we can grow virtually any microbe in the laboratory. There are a couple of exceptions, but we've gotten to the point in microbiology where we have so many different options for culture media that we can grow virtually anything. And of course, a lot of those media are just gonna encourage all bacteria to grow or, or fungi or whatever type of microbe the media is designed for. And there are those chemically defined ones that are only gonna support the non-fastidious, the, 
the more basic microbes to grow with more basic nutritional requirements. And then there are others that'll help these fastidious organisms to grow. But when it comes to the special media, now we're not just trying to grow. Now we're trying to help identify a microbe. So special media, some of them are gonna be um, designed to encourage or support the growth of one kind of microbe, maybe one genus of microbe or, or only a couple of limited genera. And others will, uh, or I should say other microbes will be inhibited from growing on that. So for example, there might be media, there are media that are used just to grow gram positive organisms. And if it's a gram negative organism, it just can't grow on that media. And you can imagine that that could be very helpful if you were trying to identify a particular type of bacteria. So we have the ability to sort of narrow down the options of what a microbe might be by using these special media. Something to know about special media is some of them contain what we call indicator dyes. If you remember from chemistry, an indicator dye is a chemical that's gonna change color when it's in different pHs. And we often add these indicator dyes to culture media because again, it's gonna help us identify a microbe. And the way it works is some of these microbes, some of these bacteria are capable of performing certain metabolic tasks. For example, they may be able to ferment a particular sugar that we put in the media. And if they can ferment it, if they can ferment that sugar, they're gonna produce a product from the sugar that changes the pH of the media. And the indicator dye will tell us that that has happened by changing color. So again, we can often look at what's growing on special media and by looking for color changes, it can give us some information about what metabolic abilities this unknown microbe has. So there are six categories in total when we talk about culture media. Um, the first two we've talked about previously. Remember we said we have chemically defined media and we have complex media. Well, the other terms we use for those are basal, and enriched. So a basal culture medium is a chemically defined medium. It's gonna support the growth of just about any non-fastidious bacteria. So as long as they don't have any special nutritional requirements, um, a basal culture medium, which is also called chemically defined, is gonna be just fine. And nutrient auger and nutrient broth are one such example. There's another one that you should be familiar with called peptone water. And all a peptone is, is a partially digested protein. That's all it is. It's a protein that's already been partially taken apart. So it's a little bit easier for the bacteria to digest. Now, in terms of complex media, the other term we use is enriched. So we're enriching this media with some very complex ingredient, something like blood or serum or egg or egg yolk. Sometimes it's milk, sometimes it's some kind of meat. Um, we're adding in something, uh, a very complex ingredient that is very nutritionally dense. And again, we don't really understand every single molecule that's present in these complex ingredients. So we refer to these as chemically undefined. We don't know exactly what's in them and we call them enriched. I've got a couple of them listed here. 
Um, there's one that, that goes by the name Luria Broth or LB. There's one that's called Blood Auger. There's one called Chocolate Auger. Unfortunately, Chocolate Auger does not contain chocolate. It is, all it is is Blood Auger that has um, been subjected to cooking. So the blood is actually heated, it's cooked and it turns a chocolate brown color. Too bad, it's not actually made out of chocolate. But obviously blood and chocolate agar, because they have the blood in them, they are enriched media. So on this slide, we're looking at some nutrient broth up at the top. One of these, I think it's this one, is the um, LB. I'm sorry, this one is the um, peptone water and this one is nutrient, doesn't really matter. The truth of the, truth of the matter is most um, broths that we make, if they are just um, basal media, if they're just chemically defined, they all pretty much look the same. They have this sort of a beige kind of yellow look to them, very boring, not a lot of color. They're basal media. They have a short list of ingredients in them and they'll grow any kind of bacteria in them that you know is non-fastidious, doesn't have any particular requirements. This is what blood auger looks like. You take, you essentially take a basal media and you add blood to it. And when the auger solidifies, it has this blood red color to it. There are some organisms that can't use the blood though, unless it's been heated up. They need the uh, cooking to occur. And that's why we also have chocolate agar available. When you heat up the blood, when you cook the blood, it turns this chocolate brown color. And there are some organisms that very specifically will grow on chocolate agar. So the first two categories of culture media are the basal or chemically defined and the enriched or complex. And those are essentially for growing microbes, growing bacteria. The next two categories are for identifying bacteria. And those are called selective media and differential media. So those would be the next two we talk about. Now, there are a lot of media, including the ones we'll talk about today, that fall into both of these categories. So they are both selective and differential. But let's talk about what each term means. What a selective media does is it allows the growth of some desired type of bacteria and inhibits the growth of other types of bacteria, the kind we don't want to grow. They're usually solid media. They're augers when we're talking about selective media. So there are many of them, but the one we're gonna be using today is called mannitol salt auger or MSA. And this is what it looks like. It has this lovely light pink color, um, mannitol, salt, agar. The mannitol is a carbohydrate. It's a sugar. And the salt is plain old sodium chloride. So we take, um, you know, one of the uh, basal medias and we add both mannitol to it and we add sodium chloride to it. And that's what um, creates MSA. There's also an indicator dye in here. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now the key to MSA really is the salt. When it comes to selecting, selecting certain bacteria and inhibiting others, it's the salt. Salt turns out to be very toxic to most bacteria. And you may already have a, a sense of that if you know any, um, any of the history of how we have preserved food throughout the centuries. Um, salt is one way that's been used for many centuries. Uh, back in the day when people would travel 
um, across oceans on ships. And it took, you know, two and three months to get where you were going. Um, they didn't have any refrigeration abilities back then. So if they wanted to have any kind of meat or poultry or fish available to eat, they had to preserve it somehow. And they would preserve it with salt. They would take, for example, um, a whole fish that had been caught and they would basically bury it in a container of salt. And that salt will inhibit almost all bacteria from growing. Um, so it makes a really nice preservative. Now it turns out though, that there's one genus of bacteria and specifically a couple of different species in that genus that don't mind salt and will grow even in a high salt environment. And that's what we use mannitol salt auger to grow. So there are two concentrations of salt that you can buy in mannitol salt auger. You can buy the seven and a half percent variety and you can also buy a 10% variety. So if you use the auger that has seven and a half percent salt in it, it's going to select or allow Staphylococcus to grow. Staphylococcus is the genus that doesn't really mine salt all that much. Now, it turns out there's only a couple of species of Staphylococcus that will grow in seven and a half salt. There's Staphylococcus aureus and another type called Staphylococcus epidermidis. Most other bacteria are gonna be inhibited from growing on a mannitol salt auger plate that has seven and a half percent salt in it. Now I've got a little note down here um, about some exceptions. I just, I don't want you to worry too much about this, but it is true that there are two other genuses. There's Enterococcus and Micrococcus. These are two other genuses or genera that will grow on seven and a half percent MSA, but they grow really poorly. So what grows well on this media is Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis. So let's say I have a sample from, um, if something arrives in the lab and it, a physician um, has made a note that they suspect that um, we're dealing with Staphylococcus aureus. Let, let's say a patient has a, a skin infection, maybe um, a boil or cellulitis, and the physician has gathered some material from that infection and notes that they suspect that this is a Staphylococcus and he's concerned that it's Staph aureus. And could we identify this microbe? One of the first things we can do if we think we're dealing with Staph aureus is take that sample and spread it onto an MSA plate. Because if it's Staph aureus, it's not gonna have any trouble growing. But if it's another type of microbe that can be found in skin infections, it's not gonna grow. So we'll automatically have some information to give back to the physician um, using this type of selective media. Now, um, I said a minute ago that um, some, uh, sometimes we get special media that are both selective and differential. Um, MSA turns out to be one of those. So we're gonna also talk about MSA being differential, but I'll do that in just a couple of minutes. In terms of the 10 and a half percent MSA, the only thing that can grow on a 10% sodium chloride plate is Staph aureus. Even Staph epidermidis will be unable to grow on, a, on an MSA plate that has 10% sodium chloride in it. That's a lot of salt. So most, the vast majority of bacteria cannot tolerate that much salt. They won't be able to survive. All right, 
Now, there are many other um, selective culture media. MSA is just one. Um, let's talk now about the next type, which is differential. Differential media are different from selective media. Instead of selecting one type to grow and then inhibiting other types, what differential media allows us to do is differentiate between strains of bacteria that are very closely related to each other. And it's the way we can differentiate between those strains is by these indicator dyes, changing the color of the media when certain metabolic pathways are occurring. So um, selective media, we're gonna select certain bacteria to grow and inhibit other bacteria from growing. Differential media, we're gonna differentiate between two very closely related strains. Remember when I use that word strain, I'm talking about a subspecies of bacteria. So there's a genus and then there's a species. And for some organisms, there's also a subspecies or a strain. And the best way to remember what a strain is, is to think about breeds of dogs. Um, all dogs have the same genus and species. The genus is Canis and the species is Familiaris. But of course, when you look at different kinds of dogs, they look very different, right? If you look at a Great Dane and a, and a Chihuahua, they look very, very different from each other. And that's because they're different breeds, right? We use the word breed when we talk about domestic animals. So a strain is essentially a breed of bacteria. You can have two organisms that have the same genus, same species, but they're different breeds. They're different strains. And differential media is gonna help us tell one from the other. All right, so going back to MSA, and that's what this is. Actually, I think this is McConkie's. Let me go back to this, this picture. This is the MSA plate. Mannitol salt auger is selective, but it's also differential. And what it's gonna help us differentiate between is Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis. Remember we said on a seven and a half percent salt MSA plate, both of those organisms can grow. Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis can grow on that plate. So if you get two organisms growing, how do you know which, which one is which? <laughs> well, this plate is also differential. Now in this case, it's allowing us to differentiate two species, not two strains, but the idea is the same. Remember this plate has a sugar in it called mannitol. And it turns out that Staphylococcus aureus can ferment this sugar. And when it does ferment mannitol, it creates a, a byproduct, an end product that is acidic. And that acidic product is gonna get released into the auger. And it's gonna turn the auger yellow. Now, when Staph epidermidis grows on this plate, Staph epidermidis cannot ferment mannitol. So it's gonna leave the media this pink color. So if it's Staph aureus, it's gonna turn the media yellow. And if it's Staph epidermidis, the media is gonna stay pink. So mannitol salt is a nice plate when you're dealing with staph species because only two kinds of staph can even grow on it, staph aureus and staph epidermis. So if you have something growing, you know it's either one of those. 
but it also helps us differentiate between those two because the staph aureus is gonna turn it yellow and the staph epidermidis isn't. So we'll be able to know which species it is that's growing on that plate. Now let's talk about some other differential media. There's one called McConkie's. We're not gonna be uh, using McConkie's auger in today's exercise, but it's a very common differential media. McConkie auger is used to, again, select and differentiate. It's selective for gram negative enteric bacteria. So bacteria that live in the gastrointestinal tract. That's what that term refers to. So anything that's gram negative, but doesn't live in the gut, that's not gonna be able to grow on this plate. And anything that's gram positive is not gonna be able to grow on this plate. Only this particular group of bacteria can grow. So it's selective for them. Now McConkie can also differentiate among the different gram negative enteric bacteria because McConkie contains a sugar called lactose. Any bacteria that can ferment lactose is gonna also secrete one of these acid products. And this time, instead of the media turning color, what happens is the colonies that are growing on the plate turn color. They turn pink. That tells us that they are lactose fermenters. Any gram negative enteric bacteria that grows and can't ferment lactose, they're not gonna be secreting one of these byproducts. So they're gonna grow as either pale cream colored colonies and sometimes even colorless colonies. So again, we'll be able to look at what's growing on the plate and we'll be able to differentiate between different types of enteric bacteria by looking at the color of the colonies. So this is another auger that is selective and differential. Another example of an auger, and this one is um, differential, is that blood auger I mentioned at the beginning of class. Remember blood auger has blood in it. It's a complex media. It's designed to help fastidious organisms grow, but it turns out it can also differentiate different types of streptococcus for us. So you can see I've got the word streptococcus here. Notice I've written SPP period here. When you wanna talk about a type of bacteria, but you only want to refer to the genus. In other words, I want to talk about all the different kinds of streptococcus. That's how you write that out. You write SPP period. That stands for species, plural. So if I want to say streptococcus species, in other words, I'm talking about all of the species of streptococcus. That's how you write that out. And blood auger can differentiate between these different streptococcus species. And that's because some species and strains of streptococcus produce an enzyme called homolysin. This is an enzyme that can break apart red blood cells. It can break them open and break them apart. So homolysin can do a process that we refer to as hemolyzing red blood cells, breaking them apart. Other types of streptococcus can't do this. And as you might guess, the types of streptococcus that produce homolysin are generally more dangerous to us. They are more pathogenic. So by growing streptococcus on blood auger, we can differentiate whether or not we have one of these homolysin producing species just by looking at the plate. What'll happen is colonies will grow on the blood auger 
And if that organism produces hemolysin, it's going to break apart all the blood cells that are nearby. And instead of seeing this nice red auger, you'll get a clear zone around the colony. That's how we know, that's how we differentiate that we have a streptococcus growing that um, can hemolyze red blood cells. So if we were to talk about blood auger, we know that it's complex or enriched. Remember, they mean the same thing. And it's also differential. But blood auger is not selective. It's not going to inhibit anything. Just about anything can grow on blood auger. So we have um, basal media or um, what we called chemically defined. We have enriched media or what we called complex. We have selective media. We have differential media. And there are two other types that you should be familiar with. Num uh, one is called transport media and the other is called storage media. Now, transport media, like the name suggests, is a media that we use when we're transporting microbial cells from one place to another, usually from the place where the cells were collected to the microbiology lab. So, um, for example, when we collect a sample, um, let's say at the water treatment facility, because we want to look for microbes and make sure that the water treatment facility is functioning normally. We would gather some, uh, a sample, and then we would need to get it to the microbiology lab in order to analyze it. Or let's say again, in a hospital setting, if a physician wants to swab some abscess material from somebody's skin, then that, that material needs to go to the microbiology lab to be analyzed. Some hospitals have their own microbiology labs, some don't, you know? So if the cells or, or the sample has to travel anywhere, you need to put it into transport media. That media is gonna help keep any microbial cells alive until they get to the laboratory. So it's not designed like most culture media are designed. It's not designed for those cells to grow wildly and divide and increase in number. It's just designed to keep them alive while that sample is traveling to the lab. So that's transport media. Now storage media is different. Storage media is for freezing microbial cells. So we're generally talking about long-term storage. Um, if you're not familiar, it's very difficult to freeze a cell and then unfreeze it and have it still be alive. The problem is not really the freezing, the problem is the thawing. And that's because living cells are full of water, right? And if you remember from chemistry, water expands when it freezes. So what happens to a cell when the water in it freezes is the water expands and it breaks the membrane. So when you're thawing out that cell, the membrane is in pieces and the cell just can't survive. Now we get around that in storage media with a molecule called glycerol. Glycerol is a really nice chemical. It's a natural compound. It's normally found in membranes. And when you put cells into glycerol before you freeze them, what'll happen is they'll take all the glycerol inside and it will sort of replace the water. So you can freeze them. The glycerol does not expand when it gets frozen. And then you can thaw those cells out later on and they'll still be alive. We learned a lot about how to freeze cells like this um, in uh, reproductive medicine, believe it or not. You know, a lot of um, procedures like um, sperm donation 
and in vitro fertilization, they require us to freeze cells and freeze embryos. And in order for those cells to be alive, when we thaw them out, you have to freeze them with glycerol. So we learned a lot about glycerol from those kinds of technologies, and we can now use it in the microbiology lab as well. We can expose the cells, the microbes to the glycerol, and then we can freeze them. And later on, we can thaw them out and use them again. So storage media is specifically for that purpose. And that brings us to the end of the six kinds of culture media, the six categories of culture media. Does anybody have any questions about any of them? As I said earlier, uh, basal media and enriched media are really just for growing, growing microbes. We want to grow them. So we have those um, possibilities, those types of media to help us do that. Selective and differential media are helping us identify microbes. They're helping us take an unknown kind of microbe, usually bacteria again, and figure out exactly what it is by, tr by trying to grow it on different types of media. So there's a, um, that's why we refer to selective and differential culture media as special. Any questions at all so far? All right, I'm gonna jump back in. All right, so like I said earlier, we're gonna uh, do an experiment today, yay. And then uh, we'll look at, uh, through the miracle of Zoom, we'll be able to look at results very quickly. So we're gonna use, um, or we're gonna consider four different kinds of bacteria today. Um, you'll often hear me talking about bacteria. I tend to call them bugs. Um, so these are the bugs that we're using today. We're using our old friend, Escherichia coli or E. coli. We're using an organism called Enterococcus faecalis. We're gonna use an organism called Staphylococcus epidermidis, which we mentioned earlier, and Staphylococcus aureus, okay? So let's think about these organisms for a minute. E. coli, E. coli is a gram-negative rod. And E. coli is an enteric organism. It's an organism that lives in the intestine, in the gastrointestinal system. Now, E. coli has lots and lots of different strains. And some of those strains are perfectly harmless. In fact, they're perfectly um, normal to have in your intestine. They're actually helpful to have in your intestine, part of your microbiome. But there are some pathogenic strains of E. coli. Enterococcus faecalis is also a gastrointestinal organism. This one though happens to be a gram positive coccus. Sometimes people refer to this organism as a fecal streptococcus. I don't know where that came from, where that terminology came from, because obviously it's not streptococcus, it's enterococcus. But I just thought I'd mention that because sometimes you still see that designation in textbooks. So we have a gram negative intestinal bacteria and we have a gram positive intestinal bacteria. And then we have the two types of staph. Now staphylococcus is gram positive. It's a gram positive coccus. And that's true for any staphylococcus. And staphylococcus epidermidis and Staphylococcus aureus are organisms that tend to be found on the skin in humans. You can also find Staph aureus in your nose. Um, you can find it in the back of your throat. But again, some Staph aureus is perfectly harmless. Some Staph epidermidis, perfectly harmless. In fact, it's considered part of your microbiome. 
the estimate is that 15% of us, 15% of us walk around with staph aureus on our skin and it doesn't bother us at all. We think of staph aureus as being a pathogen, but only certain strains of it are pathogenic. So two kinds of staph that we'll have available for our experiment. Now here's what our experiment is gonna involve. I am going to take two of these organisms and I'm not gonna tell you which two. I'm gonna mix them together and grow them in the incubator. And then I'm gonna spread them out onto two kinds of special media so that we can see if we can tell which two I pick. So our goal for the experiment is, can we tell which two bacteria are in our mixed unknown culture by examining how they grow on special media? Now here's the media we're gonna use. First of all, we're gonna use some nutrient auger just to grow each one of these organisms. And remember, nutrient auger is one of the basal, basal types of culture media. We're going to use mannitol salt auger as one of our special media. And the other one we're going to use is um, called eosin methylene blue or EMB. Now we've already talked about mannitol salt, but just as a reminder, we're going to use the seven and a half percent type. So it has seven and a half percent sodium chloride in it. It's selective for Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis. It selects against virtually all other bacteria. So these are really the only two bacteria that can grow on MSA, at least grow well on MSA. Now, MSA is also differential, remember we said? It's gonna differentiate Staph aureus because Staph aureus can ferment mannitol. Staph epidermidis is a non-fermenter. It does not ferment mannitol. So when Staph aureus ferments the mannitol, it produces an acid and it turns the auger yellow. When staph epidermidis doesn't do anything with the mannitol, the auger is gonna stay pink. So you saw this earlier, this is what MSA looks like before you inoculate it. It's that nice light pink color. And what, we'll, what we've done is we spread staph epidermidis on half of the plate and we spread Staph aureus on the other half and put it into the incubator. And this is what it looks like when it grows. So you can see there's something growing on both sides of this plate. It's easier to see it down here than it is up here, but there are these um, lines of sort of this uh, thick uh, cream colored material growing on this side of the plate too. This is the Staph epidermidis side. So it can grow on the plate, no trouble. And the media is gonna stay that same pink color that we started with. Now look over on this side. This is where we streaked out the Staph aureus. It too can grow perfectly well on MSA, but it's fermenting the mannitol. So it's um, producing an acid byproduct and the acid byproduct is turning the auger acidic and it turns yellow when it gets into an acidic pH because there's an indicator dye in here. So very easy to tell whether you've got Staphylococcus aureus down here or Staph epidermidis up here. Now, the eosin methylene blue auger or EMB is also selective and differential. It selects for 
E. coli and other what we call fecal coliforms, coliforms. Now, what a coliform is, we use that word. I can't tell you where that word came from because I don't really know, but a coliform is any bacteria that grows in the intestine again, so you can find it in feces, and it can ferment lactose. If it can ferment lactose and it lives in your gut, lives down in your intestine, it's called a coliform. So, you know, coli, E. coli makes sense that it, we call it a coliform, but there are other bacteria that are also coliforms and any of them can grow on EMB. EMB is gonna select against any gram positive organism and um, that includes our enterococcus organism, because remember we said enterococcus faecalis is a fecal streptococcus. It's a gram positive intestinal organism. E. coli and these fecal coliforms, they are gram negative. Anything gram positive is not gonna be able to grow on EMB. Now, EMB is also differential. Remember, there's a range of things that can grow on it. So we have to have a way to differentiate. Do we have E. coli or do we have another one of these fecal coliforms growing? EMB contains two kinds of sugar. It contains lactose and sucrose. So, if, it, if the organism can ferment lactose or if it can ferment both sugars on EMB, what's gonna happen is it's gonna grow as a purple colony. Again, this time the color change is not in the agar, but the colony itself, the, the um, growth itself is gonna change color. It's gonna turn purple. Now, Here's the differential part. When E. coli grows on EMB, it can ferment both sugars. It's gonna grow as a purple colony that has a very unique green metallic sheen to it. And I'll show you a picture of this. It's pretty remarkable. When you see it, you, you will recognize it immediately. So if you see that greenish color, in addition to the purple, you know you have E. coli. If you just see the purple, it's one of these other fecal coliforms. Now, it turns out that there are some gram-negative enteric organisms that cannot ferment these sugars. So there are some intestinal bacteria that are gram-negative but they're not coliforms. So they can't ferment lactose. They can't ferment sucrose. And a good example of those would be things like salmonella, which you've probably heard of, and another kind called shigella. Both salmonella and shigella can be, can be pathogenic. When a non-coliform grows on EMB, what you end up with is a colony that doesn't turn purple. It just stays sort of a clear color. So EMB will grow gram negative intestinal organisms on it. There are a lot of those. If, if the organism is a coliform, and remember that means that it can ferment uh, lactose, if it's a coliform, it's gonna grow purple as a purple colony. If it's E. coli specifically, it'll be a purple colony that has a green metallic color on top of it. If it's an enteric organism that is not a coliform, so it's gram negative, it lives in the intestine, but it's not a coliform, 
it'll grow as just a plain old sort of colorless, maybe cream colored colony. If it's anything gram positive, it's not gonna grow on EMB. All right, let's take a look at this auger. This is what EMB looks like when it's not inoculated. It's very dark. Um, some people say it looks like the color of grape juice. Um, it's got a, a dark, almost like a maroon purple color to it. So it's very dark, very distinctive looking. And remember, what'll grow on EMB is gram negative intestinal organisms. Now, when E. coli grows on EMB, you get this. This is what I mean by that really metallic looking sort of a shine on top of the colonies. You can see some little individual colonies right here. They're very small, but you can see some individual circular colonies. If you took the shine away, like if you shut this light off that we're shining onto this plate, these would be purple. But when you shine a light on them, they give this greenish metallic sort of um, sheen. That tells you it's E. coli when you see that. So very, very useful for identifying E. coli. Now take a look at this one. This is also EMB. I know it looks a little bit lighter. Um, but this is an EMB plate. What we've done is we put a streak, just one big solid streak of organism in each quadrant on this plate. This one up here is E. coli. It's got that green color that tells you it's E. coli. This is a uh, intestinal organism, gram negative, that is a coliform, can ferment lactose but it's not E. coli. So there's no metallic sheen, but you still get that light purple color. This down here is a gram negative intestinal organism that is not a coliform. So it can't ferment lactose. And I think you'll agree the, col the smear, it's not really a colony, the smear here is like, colorless. It's just sort of a, maybe a beige or cream color. It's certainly not purple. It's not like this one. And finally, if you try to grow anything gram positive on here, it's not going to grow. You're not going to get any growth at all. So selective and differential for EMB. I did want to mention one other thing just because I, I think it's kind of interesting. Sometimes when E. coli grows on EMB, not always, but sometimes you get a very special feature on the colony called a fish eye. <laughs> so take a look here first. This is just what E. coli looks like normally on EMB. Remember, E. coli is going to be purple and it's going to have the metallic sheen. Now, sometimes the sheen is most evident where you have the heaviest growth of the E. coli. So you really can't see it over here on the individual colonies, but you can see it where the big streaks are. So this is E. coli growing on EMB. Sometimes though, you get this. In the center of those purple colonies, see that little dark area in there? That's called a fish eye. Not all strains of E. coli will grow like that, but if you ever see that on an EMB plate, again, you, you know you have E. coli because you get that fish eye, that little dark place right in the middle of the colonies. That's how E. coli grows. So we're gonna use we have four possible organisms. We have E. coli, we have Enterococcus, we have Staphylococcus epidermidis, and we have Staphylococcus aureus. We're gonna spread the four organisms onto a nutrient agar plate first. Then we're gonna use the mannitol salt agar and the EMB agar 
to try to figure out which two of those organisms I mixed together for our unknown culture. So here's the first question. Why, if I'm interested in figuring out which two organisms I chose, why bother putting organisms on nutrient auger today? I said I have four organisms. I'm going to take two of them and I'm going to secretly mix them together and grow them. And I'm going to spread that unknown mixture onto MSA and onto EMB. And we're going to look at those plates and see if we can figure out which two I chose. But I also said I'm going to spread them out on nutrient auger. Why do you think I bother doing the nutrient auger? I mean, nutrient auger is just a basal auger. It's gonna make, it's gonna let almost anything grow. So why would I bother taking that step in an experiment? Any ideas? If you have any ideas, type them into the chat. My purpose, my purpose for the experiment is to see if I can figure out which two of the four organisms are in the mix. So why would I bother taking the time to first put all four organisms onto a nutrient agar plate? What do you think? So Sam and Ellie are saying, a control, it's a control. And that's exactly right. If you think about what we do when we experiment with microbes, we're experimenting with living organisms, right? So we grow up cultures of these organisms that we want to experiment with. We grow them up, say, in a broth culture. And then we take them out of the incubator and we've got these broth culture tubes and we wanna do an experiment with them. Well, we need to first make sure that those cells are alive and they're able to grow. And the best way to do that is to put them on just a nice basal auger, just a, an auger that will grow almost anything. If I can grow them on a nutrient auger plate, I know that the cells are alive and they're capable of reproducing, they're capable of growing. If I don't take that step, if I don't take that step to, to make sure, and let's say I spread them out on the special media and I get nothing growing, is it because the special media inhibited growth or is it because the cultures weren't really healthy and alive? I don't know. I don't know unless I first take the step to show that all four of those organisms, all four of those cultures are healthy and growing and they're able to divide and able to grow. It's for comparison sake, it's a control. And anytime you're working with living organisms, You've got to demonstrate that. You've got to show that this cell that you're working with is alive and able to divide. And the easiest way to do that for us in microbiology is to just grow it on some basal media. So that's what we did in our experiment. So let me just catch up here. So here's the procedure that I did for us. First, I took a nutrient auger plate and with a Sharpie pen, I separated it into four quadrants. I drew a long horizontal line and a long vertical line across the bottom of the plate. So I have four quadrants. And then using my very best aseptic technique, I just made a simple streak of each of those four cultures, each of those four pure cultures into separate quadrants, all right? I just need to show that the cells are alive and that they can grow. 
I don't need to grow isolated colonies. I don't need to count anything. All I need to do is just show that they're growing. I took the nutrient agar plate, I put it upside down into the incubator at 35 degrees centigrade, which is a very um, common temperature for a bacterial incubator for 24 hours. Okay. And here's what I got. Actually, here's what two of two other students got. This is a nutrient agar plate. This is a nutrient agar plate. You can see where the Sharpie lines are on the bottom of the plate, four quadrants. And the students just streaked. That's all they did. They took a loop full of broth culture. They took a loop from the E. coli culture. They took a loop from the Enterococcus, from the Staph epidermidis, from the Staph aureus. Same thing over here. This student just did a different uh, streaking pattern. And again, what we found was that all four, all four of our cultures are perfectly fine, perfectly healthy cells capable of growing, no problem. Then remember what I did, I picked two. I picked two of those organisms and I created this unknown culture with two different bacteria in it. So, I took two bacteria, I combined them into one tube and grew them overnight. And now I'm ready to use the special media. So I made quadrant streak plates on MSA and on EMB. Remember when you do a quadrant streak plate, you take a loop full out of your culture tube and you just smear it onto the plate first in your first quadrant. Then you take your, you um, incinerate your loop. Then you take your loop and you just drag it across that thick smear into the second quadrant and you streak it again. So essentially what you've done, what I did with this plate is I used my loop to pull a few of these cells into the second quadrant and then I spread them out. Then I incinerate my loop again I draw through the second quadrant, gather a few of those cells, streak them out in the third quadrant, incinerate my loop, draw it through the third quadrant, gather a few cells, streak them out. So if you think about what you're doing with a quadrant streak plate is you're going from a big high number of cells in that first quadrant to hopefully very few cells in this last quadrant that are all spread out. And what I should get is individual colonies growing if I've um, done everything correctly. And I want individual colonies, don't I? Because not on the MSA plate, but on the EMB plate, I need to be able to look at the colonies to see their color. I need to know if they're growing as purple colonies or as clear colonies. I need to be able to see that. Not so much on the MSA plate, but it's, um, it's a, uh, important for the EMB plate. All right, let's take a look at the results. Again, this is a plate that a student made, but the results um, are fine. The results are good. So the student drew a grid on the bottom of this plate because it was helpful for her while she was doing her quadrant streak to keep the four quadrants separate. So she put the original loop full into quadrant one, then she drew her loop through there and spread it into two and three and four. Now you can't really see it because the plate is upside down, but there are individual colonies growing you can see a couple of them, circular colonies, circular colonies growing, all right? What you can also see is that this MSA plate has turned yellow where the colonies are growing, right? Now I can tell you this, we examine this plate very closely. There is only one colony type 
on this plate. So there is one organism growing on this plate and it turns the auger yellow. So we already have a lot of information, don't we? We already have a lot of information. Of our four organisms, only two of them are capable of even growing on MSA. One of them, one of them grew, one of our unknowns grew and it turned the auger yellow. So we have a lot of information so far. Now take a look at our EMB plate. Uh-oh. Yeah, that's right. When we spread our unknown culture onto the EMB plate, our two organisms on the EMB plate, we got nothing, nothing grew. Remember, we tested, we tested these cultures on nutrient auger. All four of those cultures were perfectly healthy. I chose two organisms. We spread them onto that EMB. We didn't get any growth. So that tells us that whatever's in our unknown was selected against on the EMB plate. Whatever was in our, whatever is in our unknown culture, the it just can't grow on EMB. So again, we have a lot of information, don't we? We have a lot of information about which two organisms are in that group or in our unknown. So this is what we have to ask ourselves, basically. Could E. coli be one of the two unknown bacteria in our culture? Could Enterococcus faecalis be in there? Could S. epidermidis be in there? Could S. aureus be in there? I chose two of them. I mixed them together and we spread them out on the plates. We didn't get two different organisms growing, did we? <laughs> in fact, we didn't get anything growing on this plate. This plate must have selected against both of our organisms. So let's walk through this. First, let's think about E. coli. First of all, could E. coli be one of our two unknowns? Well, we know E. coli cannot grow on MSA. It can't. Remember, Staph aureus can grow and Staph epidermidis can grow. So we wouldn't expect E. coli to grow on this plate. Now you'll notice I wrote check mark over here. Hmm, why did I put a check mark there? We only got one organism to grow on that plate, right? It's the one that grew and turned the auger yellow. Maybe E. coli is in our culture and it's the one that didn't grow on the plate. Does that make sense? We put two bacteria on the MSA plate. One of them grew, one of them didn't grow. So maybe the one that didn't grow was E. coli. E. coli doesn't grow on MSA. So, you know, that would make sense. If we just had the MSA plate, if we just had that MSA plate, we wouldn't be able to rule out E. coli, would we? Because we don't expect E. coli to grow on MSA. So if we only had the MSA plate, we wouldn't really know. But guess what? We also had the EMB plate, right? We had two. And if you remember, nothing grew on the EMB plate. E. coli grows great on EMB. E. coli grows as purple colonies and then they have green color to them. So what do we think? Well, we can't have E. coli in our unknown culture. We can't. 
if we did, it would have grown on that EMB plate. It would have grown as a purple colony and now that, that colony would have had a green color to it. We didn't see that. Nothing grew on EMB. So whatever is in our mixed culture, whatever two organisms are in there, we know E. coli can't be one of them. Now, does that make sense? This is a process where sometimes we have confirmatory information, right? Sometimes we're looking at something growing, we can see a color change, so we know we have an organism because it's right in front of us. But sometimes what we have is sort of negative information. We have nothing growing, but that tells us something too, because we can use the process of elimination there. And we can say, well, it, it could be this because this isn't supposed to grow. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes we have a positive confirmatory result, and sometimes we have the process of elimination, essentially. We can say so far, we can say that I didn't choose E. coli for the unknown culture because if I had, if we had E. coli in that broth tube, it should have grown on the EMB and it didn't. Whatever's in there did not grow on EMB, neither organism. Does that make sense? Let me say, does that not make sense to anybody? Remember EMB, the only things that grow on EMB are gram negative intestinal or fecal organisms. It selects for those and it selects against gram positives. It also differentiates. So when something grows, when you have a gram negative enteric organism, it's gonna differentiate E. coli, other coliforms and non coliforms. E. coli will be green, other coliforms will be purple, non coliforms will be clear. I got no growth on that plate. So there is no fecal gram negative organism in my unknown mixture. Make sense? Speak now if it doesn't, and I will go through it again with you. All right, let's move forward. Let's think about Enterococcus. Now, I don't, um, you probably don't remember, so I'm gonna scroll back to our organism slide. Enterococcus is a fecal organism, Enterococcus fecalis. It is an intestinal fecal organism, but it's gram positive, all right? We know that EMB selects against gram positives. So gram positive organisms cannot grow on EMB, all right? We got nothing growing on EMB, so check mark. <laughs> it could be, it still could be Enterococcus fecalis. Enterococcus faecalis also cannot grow on MSA. We got one thing to grow, but there's a second organism that we spread on this plate that just didn't grow. So it's still possible that Enterococcus faecalis is in our mixed culture. We don't expect it to grow on MSA. So maybe it's the second organism, the one that didn't grow. We don't expect it to grow on EMB. So E. fecalis, we can't rule out yet, can we? Because both of those results make sense. All right, let's look at the Staphylococcus. 
Could Staphylococcus epidermidis be one of the two unknown organisms? Well, we know Staph epidermidis grows well on MSA. It could be this organism, right? Something grew well here, except we also know that Staph epidermidis leaves the media pink. And this organism turned it yellow. So according to this plate, it is not Staph epidermidis. We would not expect Staph epidermidis to grow on EMB because Staph epidermidis is gram positive. So we've ruled out Staph epidermidis because if it was this organism, it should have left the media pink. Last on the list is Staph aureus. Staph aureus, again, grows very well on MSA and turns yellow, turns the media yellow. Remember, Staph aureus ferments the mannitol that is in mannitol salt auger. And it makes an acid byproduct that changes the pH of the auger and the indicator dye turns it yellow. So ding, 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 we have a winner. This is Staph aureus growing on this plate. It can't be anything else. Nothing else should give us that result. So we have a, what we would consider a confirmatory result for Staph aureus because we have literally the Staph aureus growing the way we expect it to grow. That's a confirmatory result. So one of the two unknowns is Staph aureus. The question is, what's the other one? What's the other one? What have we ruled out for sure? And what have we not ruled out yet? Which of the other three do you think is the second organism? Remember, we have E. coli as a possibility. We have E. faecalis as a possibility. And we have Staphylococcus epidermidis as a possibility. So which one do you think is the second organism in the unknown culture? Go ahead and type your guess on, into the chat. Good job, Izzy. Good job, Morgan. Good job, Ellie. Enterococcus faecalis. It's the only one we haven't ruled out yet, right? Good job, Davina. Right? We know it's not E. coli. Because if it was E. coli in that unknown mix, it should have grown on EMB. It should have, and it should have turned purple and it should have been green. So we know it's not E. coli. Staph epidermidis, we know it's not Staph epidermidis because if it was, we should have had colonies growing on the MSA that left the media pink. We didn't get that. So we know it's not Staph epidermidis. The only thing left is Enterococcus faecalis. So, so for that one, we didn't even grow it, did we? But we still know it has to be that one because we ruled out everything else. Enterococcus faecalis. It's a gram positive. It lives in the intestine, but it's a gram positive. The coccus, Enterococcus, it's, a, it's similar to a streptococcus organism, but it's not the same genus. It's a gram-positive coccus. It lives in the intestine, yep, but it's not gram-negative. So we know, we know that gram-positives do not grow on EMB. We know that some gram-positives can grow on MSA, but they're staph, they're staphylococcus. So 
it's all, it's the only result we could have is the enterococcus fecalis is the second one. Good job, good job. So, you know, this, this exercise, this is a little artificial, right? Because you had a list of possibilities. We started off with a list of possibilities. And obviously most of the time in the laboratory, we don't have a list of possibilities. It could be anything, but we do get you know, we get some information. Um, if we know where the sample came from, that's some information. You know, we, if, if we're told that this sample came out of a lake, that tells us something. If we know it came out of somebody, the back of somebody's throat, that tells us something, right? So we almost always have a little information to start with. And then it's our job to use these special media to try to rule in an organism or rule out an organism. And, and with those results, we can often come up with an identification for what organism we're dealing with. Good job, everybody. All right. So E. coli should have grown on EMB and didn't. So it wasn't E. coli. Staph epidermidis should have grown on MSA and left the media pink. Didn't do that. We know it's not that one. Staph aureus, yep, grows on MSA, turns the media yellow. Ding, ding, ding. That's what we got. And finally, Enterococcus fecalis. This is a gram positive. It lives in the intestine. It can't grow on either media. And that's what we saw. We saw one of the organisms not grow, which is kind of interesting, kind of fascinating. All right. Any questions? When it comes to differentiating organisms in the laboratory, some of the most difficult differentiation work that gets done is gram negatives. And that's because as we've talked about in here, there are a lot of bacteria growing in your intestine and in everyone's intestine. And many of them are gram negative. So if a person has signs and symptoms of intestinal disease and those signs and symptoms point towards a pathogen, a bacterial pathogen, it can be tough to diagnose exactly which gram negative organism is causing that disease. Especially since we know that some E. coli are good. Some E. coli are bad. Some uh, enterococcus are good. Some enterococcus are bad. It can be really tough and it can take several different tests in order to determine exactly what we have under different conditions. <laughs> That's okay, Davina. Believe me, I understand the challenges of technology, <laughs> the challenges of getting uh, tossed off of Wi-Fi. I totally understand. So, <laughs> all right. So um, that's all I have for you today. I'm going to let you go now. Um, remember, you have lecture exam to complete if you haven't already. Get that to me by eight o'clock, or let me know if you can't get it to me by eight o'clock. Um, I'm happy to give you an extension if you need it. Remember, you have one lecture topic to do this week, the biochemistry material and a quiz that goes with that. And you've got this uh, lab, you've got the questions associated with this lab um, to answer. Uh, those are due by Sunday at midnight, okay? And if there's no other questions, I'm gonna let you go. We don't meet on Thursday. 
But remember, you can always reach out to me. You can message me if anything comes up and you have any questions. I'm happy to go through it with you again. All right. All right. I hope everybody has a nice evening. Enjoy the, uh, the, the extra light, right? Enjoy the daylight that, that we now have. You're very Thank welcome, you. everybody. I'll see you next time.